Do you find yourselves frequently saying yes when you'd prefer to say no? Do you find yourself always giving in to the needs and the expectations of others? If so, you could be struggling with people pleasing. You see, at its root, people pleasing is stemmed in low self-esteem and insecurity. The need for others to like you is actually driven by the unhealthy compulsion to do more for them than you should be doing. And oftentimes people pleasers have a tendency to do things for others that others should be doing for themselves. So a people pleaser can be defined as a giver and guess what givers attract? Takers. But what you may not realize is a lot of people pleasers react out of fear. They don't advocate for themselves because they have a fear of either losing the relationship, uh, maybe starting an argument. Uh, they do not like confrontation. My friend, if you're struggling with people pleasing, please let me know in the chat, say, I hate confrontation. And that is one of the biggest struggles that a people pleaser will go through and they don't like confrontation. So now I'm going to look to do what I need to do to avoid that argument or, or even a potential argument. They also don't like to deal with uncomfortable feelings. So they have this fear that they're going to be left feeling all of these uncomfortable emotions that they just don't know what to do with. So studies show that many who come from a traumatic past are actually more likely to be diagnosed with the disease to please. Now, I also say that tongue in cheek. It's not a diagnosis, my friend, but it, the struggle is real. So if you know that, let me know in the chat. The struggle is real. And while we can look to our past sometimes to help us, what we always want to make sure that we do is we always want to look to the Bible. We want to look and see what does God have to say about this? And Galatians 1.10, my friend, says it best when it says this, for now am I seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So for every people pleaser out there who is deceiving themselves into thinking that they are doing God's work by serving others, the scripture just obliterated that. You see, when people pleasing replaces God pleasing, we're walking on very thin spiritual ice. Because at the root of all people pleasing, like I said before, is fear. It's a fear of rejection, a fear of failure. And since approval is a driving force and a people pleaser, it is no surprise to see while some would do whatever is necessary to avoid letting some pe other people down. So what I want to talk to you about today is the seven warning signs of people pleasing, and we're going to dive into how to stop. So the first sign of people pleasing is you can't say no. It's it, it, for people pleasers. It's, it's as though saying yes is an addiction that they just can't kick. It's a constant yes. Even if you know in the back of your mind or even in the forefront of your mind, like I shouldn't be saying yes, but you still do it anyway. It's almost like a compulsion. I remember not, this was a while ago. I was actually in a I was in church and I was just about to leave and one of the leaders caught me and she says, oh, we're having this retreat coming up and here I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get invited and yeah, maybe I can just kind of you know, find my way out of that. And she goes, no, 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 we have this, you know, ladies night coming up and we need you to speak at it. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness. Okay. In my mind, I'm going, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so inundated. I'm just so tired that I should be saying no, but I mean, this is what I do for a living. So, okay, it's, a, it's only 30 minutes. That's fine. My friend, what I didn't realize is that that 30 minutes turned into a six hour event from, 
hey, I need you to come in early to, hey, can you get everything set up? Or, hey, why don't you go ahead and make some cupcakes for the event? Or, hey, we're going to need you to break everything down and put it back because we have another event tomorrow morning. My friend, I was there until like 11 o'clock at night and it was just absolutely exhausting. And I was driving home and I'm thinking to myself, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And I'm starting to analyze it from a business standpoint and from a, um, you know, a biblical standpoint. And I'm like, okay, why was I doing that? And the truth was it hit me like a ton of bricks. My friend, the Holy Spirit revealed to me is your people pleasing. You were supposed to say no. I gave you the unction to say no when I reminded you of how exhausted you were, when I reminded you of how much you had going on. I prompted you to say no, but you felt compelled to say yes. And it was in those moments that I recognized that I did it more often than I thought. Now, I never would have considered myself a people pleaser, but I was doing it far more often than I thought. So, If you find yourself constantly saying yes when you'd prefer to say no, or even when you know to say no, then you are likely a people pleaser. Number two is you actually feel guilty setting boundaries. And this is where a lot of people pleasers will get hung up because oftentimes it's easier to say yes than it is to deal with the guilt afterwards. But my friend, I can assure you, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, if you can learn how to get comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings, learn how to actually work through that guilt, you will come to a place where that will bring resolution. But the constantly saying yes to people to avoid the guilt, that's never going to bring any resolution. In fact, all you're going to look to do is draw is um, is attract more people who want to get a yes from you. So I, I donate a, to a lot of uh, animal organizations. And how many of you know that once you donate to one of these organizations, they all come after you? My, my husband picked up the mail not too long ago, and I usually do it. And he's looking at this pile of mail and he's like, what is this? Why are we getting so many envelopes in the mail? And he's going through each and every one of them. He says, do you donate to all of these? And I said, no. But the truth is, is once you donate to one, they all come flooding in. And the same is true for being a giver. The same is true for being somebody who just can't seem to say no, who's always saying yes. My friend, all of these people are now going to start coming out of the woodworks. And the ones who you've been saying yes to constantly aren't going to stop. You see, people pleasers believe, honestly believe, that at some point somebody's going to get it. They're going to understand that I've really, really been working hard here and they're going to see just how exhausted I am and they're going to want to give me a break because that's what I would do for people. But my friend, it's not going to happen. So if you feel guilty about setting boundaries, it is highly likely that you are struggling with people pleasing. The third sign is that you need permission to take time for yourself. We just touched on this a minute ago that a lot of people pleasers believe that somebody else is going to be responsible for their self-care. So if you say, oh, no, 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 I don't need you today. Why don't you go ahead and go get a massage? Why don't you go relax? Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people pleasers won't even jump on this advice anyway. However, it's as if they need that permission from somebody else. But the truth is you have to give yourself permission. You have to be able to have the the inner conviction to say, I'm important too. And my rest is important as well. So you have an enemy, Satan, and he's got a slew of demons that will stop at nothing to drain you dry through distractions, through giving, through things that seem Christ-like. And he's going to put that impression upon you that that self-care is somehow selfish. And, And to some people, it actually will appear to be selfish. 
when I say to some of my friends or maybe even my family that, no, you know what? I don't want to do that with you or for you right now. I need to go lay down and take a few minutes rest. To them, that actually may seem selfish. So if I need their permission to not be selfish, guess what's going to happen? My friend, I'm never going to get to go lay down and recharge my batteries so I can be the best at who God created me to be, not at who you're demanding me to be. So number four is you actually frequently apologize, especially for things that you don't need to. Are you the type of person that when you you bump into somebody, it's all, all of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you didn't even do it. They were the one that was careless. Or do you find yourself, you know, asking somebody for something? Maybe you go into a store and the clerk is talking behind the counter and you interrupt by saying, I'm, I'm sorry. If you find yourself constantly apologizing for things that you're not doing wrong, it is highly likely that you are a people pleaser. So my friend, if you are getting value out of our time today, would you do me a favor and go ahead and hit that like button? I would greatly appreciate it. I'm also going to ask that you allow me two seconds of your grace as it seems like the lighting keeps uh, dimming and I want to kind of turn up the brightness. So guys, talk amongst yourselves for just a moment because we're going to address this. I want to get some brightness back. Please let me know. Did that make any difference? Okay. So if you are constantly apologizing, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Or when somebody says like, you know, um, I, I could come up with so many examples and I think you understand what I'm saying is you're just constantly apologizing. So when somebody asks you to do something and you can't do it and you're like, I'm so sorry as opposed to, unfortunately, I'm unavailable. But we're actually going to get back to that in just a few minutes. So please let me know if you're number four, if you're the I'm so sorry kind of person. Number five, warning sign number five, you have a high need for approval. If you are always looking for people to approve of what you say and what you do and your actions and your behaviors and your words, my friend, you are going to get caught in the people pleasing trap like you wouldn't believe. Because when we aim to please others, that means I need your approval. And that's why we go back to Galatians 1.10. Am I trying to please God or am I trying to please man? Because if I'm trying to please man, I am not a servant of Christ. So if you are constantly trying to please other people because you need the approval, then yeah, my friend, you are likely a very strong people pleaser. Okay, number six, you struggle with insecurity and low self-esteem. This this, this, this speaks to number five, when you're constantly looking for approval from other people, it typically stems from that insecurity and that low self-esteem. I think so lowly of myself that now I'm projecting this outwards and I need you to validate me. Now, I'm not talking about a validation, you know, that's a normal give and take in a relationship when somebody says, I'm not feeling well, and then you say, I'm so sorry, how can I pray for you? You acknowledge that, you validate what they're going through. What I'm referring to is that validation that you are so longing for that you actually need because it's just non-existent. Not you're looking for somebody to confirm, you're looking for somebody to affirm. So you don't have in you what should already be there, that sense of identity, that sense of, and I don't even want to say confidence because I'm not a huge fan of confidence. I don't know about you guys. I don't really have any confidence in myself or in my flesh. All of my confidence comes from Jesus, but there is a confidence there. So when I'm struggling with such insecurity in who I am and what I do and what I have to offer to the relationship I am now going to look to someone else to tell me 
that I am valuable. So since people aren't walking around giving validation out like it's their pennies, you will likely constantly try to do things for these people, number one, that they should probably be doing for themselves, and number two, I just lost my train of thought. So we'll just stick with number one. You find yourself doing these things for people that they should be doing for themselves in in order to gain their likeness. I want to like you. So we're going to talk about this insecurity and low self-esteem in just a moment, but please let me know in the chat if this is you. You can say I'm number six. And number seven, here's the seventh warning sign is you fear the opinions of others. Now, there are people that actually like to argue. They like to debate. And then there are other people that really don't prefer the confrontation. Now, these are different styles. I'm not talking about a different style. I am talking about a full-on fear that you cannot have a difference of opinion. You cannot have an opinion outside of me. Why? Because now I don't know how to handle myself. Because you're not giving me that validation, that confirmation, that approval. I need all of that because I'm not secure in who I am. So your difference of opinion is now rocking my world. So here's what a lot of people pleasers will do. Instead of arguing their opinion or debating, or even just gently saying, respectfully saying, you know, um, what's that saying? Let's agree to disagree. They will actually change their opinion because they need, we're going back to number five, they need that approval from other people because they fear so much the disapproval, I can't stand a difference of opinion. So guys, let me know which one you are. Are you number one? You can't say no. Are you number two? You feel guilty for setting boundaries. Are you number three? Do you need permission to take time for yourself? Are you number four? Do you frequently apologize for things? Are you number five? Do you have a high need for approval? Or maybe you're number six. You struggle with insecurity. Or let me know if you're number seven and you fear the opinion of others. Let me know in the chat which one you are. You see, fearing the opinions of others also encompasses fearing the label that's going to get put on you. So for example, if we talk about the analogy that I gave earlier, when, you know, my friends want to go do something or my family wants to go do something, I'm just absolutely exhausted. And I know that a good 30 minutes of just laying down is going to make a big difference for me. If I'm afraid that they think, bear with me a second, that they think I'm selfish, then that's what my fear is. My fear is being labeled as selfish. And I'm not looking at what the actual knowing is. I know I'm not selfish. I know I'm a very giving person, but you also can't get blood from a stone. If there's no gas left in this tank, this vehicle isn't going anywhere. So, but if my fear is that somebody else is going to think less of me, and we often fear labels. So we don't just fear, okay, they're going to be disappointed with me. We, we start to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not catastrophize, but we, we kind of blow it out of proportion in that not only do I fear that they're going to be upset with me, but now I'm labeled a selfish person. So that one act of, I just want to go lay down and refresh myself now qualifies me as being a completely selfish person, which of course I'm not, and I don't want to be. So in order to prove to you that I'm not, now I have to do what you're asking me to do. Do you see the trap that people pleasers can get themselves in? It is a vicious, vicious cycle. But I want to be able to spring something on you that is probably going to hurt. This is going to be a little bit of a Um, a gut punch, but I'm going to follow it up with a hug. So don't worry. People pleasers operate more out of selfishness than they do self-sacrifice. Ouch. I know it's hard to hear and it's even hard to imagine, but the people pleasers are actually looking to quiet 
the anxiety within them. They're the ones that are looking for the validation. They're the ones that are looking for the security. They're the ones that are looking for the approval. They're the ones that are looking to get rid of all those guilty, ugly feelings. So it really is that people pleasing really comes down to, I want to feel good. I don't want to feel that way. I want you to see me in a, in a specific way. It really is driven by more of a selfishness, a selfish desire than it is a self-sacrifice. And that's where a lot of people pleasers can get hung up because we often see these qualities, you know, the giving and the self-sacrificing and always saying yes, even if we want to say no, we see them as commendable and Christ-like. But I got a, I got a one-two punch for you right now. They're actually not commendable and Christ-like. It's actually idolatry in disguise. Yes, some people pleasers come to the awareness and the acceptance of the fact that they are elevating others and not God. You see, when we people please, we are elevating another person into a position they do not belong in. Only God belongs in that position. So we actually cross over and we're not serving others, we're worshiping others. And I realize it's very difficult to see it this way because you see yourself as a very generous person. And I have no doubt that you are. You see yourself as a very giving person. And I am sure that you are. But What's happening is we look to now manipulate the situation in order to get my needs met. So I'm now going to elevate these people and I'm going to give them what they want. And if I'm idol, if I'm idolizing people, where do you think God fits in on all that? Here's what I want you to remind you of. It's Proverbs 29, 25, and it says this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. My friend, people pleasers fear man. They fear what they think. They fear what they will do to them. They fear how this person will make them feel, and it is going to be a trap for you. So I want to take a few minutes before we dive into some questions. I know you guys love to get into some Q&A. And by the way, if you guys do have any questions, please make sure that you put question marks before and after your questions. We do our best to get to as many as possible. Uh, Our moderators will go ahead and grab the questions. They will be sent over to me. So if you do have them, get them in as early as possible so we can get definitely a jump on that and hopefully answer your questions. I do want to dive into how we're going to break free because it is never my desire to just call these things out and leave you stuck. I want to see you set free in the mighty name of Jesus. So the first thing that I want you to do is to become secure in your relationship with God. My friend, don't fool yourself in just saying, oh yeah, yes, I love God or oh yes, I do my devotional or yeah, I go to my women's Bible study or yeah, I've got my men's group over here. My friend, it really all comes down to a security in your relationship with God. Do you know who you are and whose you are? You are not who someone else says you am. You are. You are. <laughs> I am. Um, you are not who someone else says that you are. You are who God says that you are. But in every situation... We have a choice. I, I I literally have to choose whether I believe what somebody else says about me or I believe what God says about me. And if my fear of what these people are going to say to me or do to me is so strong, my friend, please don't fool yourself. It is going to completely outweigh what God says about you. Because I know you know in your head what God says about you. 
but it's that fear that is overriding it. But here's what I want to begin to override that fear is 1 John 4, 18. I actually don't have it on screen, so I'm going to encourage you to look it up. Actually, make this your verse for the week. 1 John 4, 18 reminds us that perfect love casts out fear. If I were to ask you, what's the opposite of fear? Most people would say faith. That's actually not true. The opposite of fear is love. So if I have the love of God flowing to me and through me, now it can come out to others. And I am not burdened by that fear of what somebody else thinks. So if I'm not washed over in the love of God, if I am not secure in his profound, amazing love, the love that knows no depth, no height, no breadth, no width, no nothing, If I am not secure in that, I'm going to get caught in the fear. And that's what's going to drive the people-pleasing behaviors. So in in case you know, we're going to get into some practical steps, but guys, I want to dive deeper than just the practical in just telling you, you know, say no, (laughs) or, you know, tell them this or not that. Don't worry. We're going to get into some of the practical in just a minute, but I really want to get down deep because it's the fear that is driving this. So I could give you eight principles, 10 scriptures, and if you have an intense fear, it is going to completely override any practical step that I'm going to give you. So what is now going to override that fear? My friend, I got to be honest with you. It's not going to be any behavioral change or practical step. It is going to be the love of God. When his love washes over you and you know who you are and whose you are. You are not the opinion of someone else. You had an identity before anyone had an opinion. So now I want to embrace that opinion of what, (laughs) no, sorry. I don't want to embrace the opinion. I want to embrace what God says about me so I can reject that opinion if necessary. So my friend, you have to become secure in your relationship with God. Number two, I want to encourage you to become secure in who you are as a unique creation in Christ. Now you may be saying to me, Chris, what's the difference? Well, becoming secure in who you are and whose you are, that means I am a child of God, bar none, doesn't make a difference what you say, what I go through, what I do. I'm a child of God and I'm his. I don't belong to this world. I don't belong to toxic people. I don't belong to the enemy. I belong to my God. So that's who I am and that's whose I am. But I also want you to become secure in who you are as a unique creation. Take a look around. We're all different. Some are introverts, some are extroverts. Some prefer dance, some prefer music, some prefer movies, some prefer books, some prefer socializing, some prefer uh, reading. You know, we, we all have so many differences. So God has made us unique creations. Psalm 139, 13 says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God was intricate in how he knit you together in your mother's womb, right down to your desires, your experiences, and your temperament. And that's where I'd like you to begin. I want you to begin with really understanding your temperament. Now you might be saying to me, Chris, what is temperament? Well, temperament is similar to like a personality profile, only it's like way cooler and a lot more in depth and it's actually biblically based. So I did create a, what's my temperament guide. It's free. We'll go ahead. Zoe, if you could, um, pop a link in the chat for that, Uh, I would appreciate if you're watching on the replay, it will be down in the description section below. My friend, I want you to get to know who you are because if you're waiting for others to tell you who you are, then you're going to be number one, waiting a long time. And number two, you're going to be like that, 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 um, that ship in the wind. I mean, you're just, you're, you're flopping back and forth. This person says this thing one day, that person says something else the next day. Your identity changes like I, I, I changed my makeup. 
So we really want to become secure in who you are as a unique creation in Christ. And this actually goes back to now uh, when somebody has a different opinion. Remember, I think it was numbers five, four guys remind me, let me know in the chat. If we fear the opinion of somebody else, it's because I'm not secure in who I am. So I want you to start to get really grounded in your identity. In fact, I want to challenge you. We're going to be wrapping up this live stream in, in just a little bit after we answer some questions. I want you to take a few minutes. And the first thing I want you to do is to sit down, your pen and paper, and start asking the Holy Spirit, what do I like? What do I dislike? What are my desires? What are my goals in life? And I can assure you, my friend, once you get this floodgate started, it won't stop because he wants you to understand who you are. Why? Because he made you. He does not want you to form your identity based upon somebody else and especially the people that the enemy sends in your way. So sit down. What are my likes? What are my dislikes? What are my preferences? Uh, what are some of my dreams? What are my hopes? And, and my friend, I want to encourage you to put the butts out of the way. I get it. You could be saying, oh, I, I would love to go back to school for such and such, but, you know, I have three kids and I have this, but just put the butts aside. In fact, you can put them on another piece of paper because they're valid, perhaps, but I don't want them to stop the exploration process. So now once you start to go through this, what are my dislikes? What brings me joy? What gets me upset? What gets me really, really fired up? I want you to start to get to know yourself. Then jump on over to the link that we just included here and read about your temperament. Start to self-identify. There's another test that you can take that um, I've, I've had some interesting results with, and that's the Myers-Briggs. Uh, it gives you... Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying, guys. I am not saying that you identify as, you know, a... A, an ENTP or identify as an INFJ or that's not who you are. But some of these tests actually are, are really insightful to be able to share with you what's already there. And I find them to be extremely helpful for those who have just ignored it, who have designed their lives around the needs and expectations of others so much so that when somebody says, hey, just be yourself, you're like, great, but who am I? That's what I want you to start discovering. Who are you? Because if you're out there constantly trying to find your identity in other people, number one, that identity, identity is going to be on very shaky ground. Number two, it's going to constantly change. So become secure in who you are, not only in Christ, but who you are as a creation. You are very unique, my friend. The next thing that I want you to do is I want you to elevate your desires to please God. I don't want you to elevate the desires of other people. You see, because when your aim is to please God, your desire to please others can start to diminish. And, and I know what I know what a lot of people pleasers are going to say. And you'll be like, but that's going to be so selfish. It's really not. It's not swinging the pendulum all the way to the other side where I completely reject people and I don't do anything for them and I'm never self-sacrificing and I never give the coat off my back or go the extra mile. That is not what I'm talking about. And that's where a lot of people pleasers will, will miss here. They'll hear, oh, I have to start pleasing God and rejecting other people. Well, that's not very loving. So now they're caught in this confusion. Mm -mm. part of pleasing God is going to be of service to others. But here's the difference, my friend. I want God to tell you who to be of service to. Not these other people. Not the people that Satan is sending your way. Now, don't get me wrong. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Satan is sending every single person that is asking something from you. You have a big part in this. Believe me. So it's, they're, they're, all of them are not... To blame. But what I want to do is I have a limited amount of time on this earth. 
I'm, I'm not going to reveal my age, but if you're, if you're up there, <laughs> you, you begin to recognize that your time is limited. You only have a certain number of weekends left. You only have a certain amount of energy left. And do I really want to waste this? I don't know, baking cookies for some bake sale that really doesn't hold value to me. And I have no energy to do the things that God is calling me to do. That's what I'm talking about. We have to be very select. And my friend, I assure you, even if you're 20 years old and you've got all the energy in the world, you don't have all the time in the world. You still only have 24 hours in a day. You still only have seven days in a week. So do you want to use that energy, that time to please other people or to please God? Let God direct your steps. And I assure you, my friend, you will be pleasing the people that he needs you to please. Okay. Guys, if you're getting value out of our time together and you're being blessed, would you do me a favor and hit that like button? I greatly appreciate it. And of course, if you're not subscribed, please be sure to do so. We put out content every single week to help you find biblical solutions to every challenge that you're going through in life. So you don't want to miss any of this. Make sure that you hit that notification button as well. So now we're going to dive into some of the practical steps. Here's what I want to help you stop doing. <laughs> if you're taking notes, write this down, underline it, asterisk it, highlight it, do whatever you got to do. Stop apologizing. Stop apologizing. There is a better way to show appreciation than apologizing. So for example, if you say to some, if, if you were late, you, instead of, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, which let's be honest, what you're looking to do in that moment is you're looking for them to say, no, no, it's okay. I totally understand why. So you can feel better. My friend, I, I really hate to come in with that kind of punch, but it's really what it's coming down to is you want somebody else to make you feel better. You want to feel better. And I get it. You probably are sorry that you're late. However, that constant apologizing and then the, oh, I feel so bad. And now here's what you're doing in that relationship. You're making it all about you. So not only were you late, but now you walk in. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, I feel so bad. Oh, I feel so terrible. Now you're interrupting whatever they've got going on. Now you're causing them to have to turn their energy and their focus on making you feel better when you were the one who was late. Do you see how twisted the enemy can get us in this whole people pleasing? And we position it as caring and giving, and it's not so. So here's how we can do that better. First of all, don't be late, and then you won't have to apologize, but it happens. You know, we're late sometimes. So instead of walking in, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, how about thank you so much for waiting for me. I really appreciate it. That implies a gratitude. It, it implies the, I am sorry. Thank you so much for waiting. I appreciate it. Now, of course, if you make a habit out of it, somebody's going to be like, okay, well, I, all right, this has to stop. But even with you constantly saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Oh, I feel so bad. I feel so bad. Again, that's coming back to you. So if there's habits that you need to change, stop doing them. But instead of apologizing, just thank the person for what they did do for you. Also, I want you to become very aware of apologizing for things that you didn't do. So we just talked a minute ago about apologizing for something you did do, which you should. So that's not what I'm encouraging. I'm not saying stop apologizing because if you did do something wrong, I do want you to repent to somebody because repentance and apology are different. Repentance means that I am very convicted of this. I want to stop this behavior and it is going to stop because I value you and I value my God more than I value this behavior. So if you do need to repent, of course, repent. 
But my friend, don't get caught in the, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I feel so bad trap, because that's not about them, that's now about you. You, f- you are so sorry because now you feel bad. So apologize when you need to apologize, but stop apologizing, especially for things that you don't need to. Something that you didn't do, taking responsibility for something that wasn't your fault, do not apologize for that. And again, people pleasers have a tendency to do this. Do not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying go swing that pendulum all the way to the other side and now suddenly become a, a, a jerk and, you know, f- disregard everybody else. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a healthy interchange with somebody when you've done something wrong, repent. When you haven't, don't. Okay. The next thing that I want you to do is to check your boundaries. Many people pleasers who don't set boundaries also don't receive them very well. They can't accept the no from somebody else. Many people pleasers view no as unloving. So it's not just one-sided. It is... It works both ways. They don't want to say no, and they also have a difficult time receiving no. And they tend to get very manipulative when they're no, when they get met with a no. You know, oh, I've done so much for you, or, you know, after all I've given you, they tend to use manipulation. And I want you to be very careful because number one, that's, that's witchcraft. Number two is now you're stomping on somebody else's boundaries. And just because you have a tough time upholding boundaries doesn't make it okay to now cross somebody else's. So let's start there. Let's start respecting somebody else's no. So I want you to catch yourself. How often do I struggle when somebody put a boundary up with me? What's going on inside of me? You know, am, am I, am I mad? Am I sad? Uh, am I tempted to manipulate? Am I tempted to throw out a guilt trip? And now I want you to take that to the Holy Spirit and ask him to do a work in you in this. Because my friend, healthy relationships require healthy boundaries on both sides. See, a lot of times people pleasers will blame somebody else. They don't, they're not respecting my boundaries. Well, it also has to start with you too. So begin by accepting the no. And the last thing, the last piece of advice I want to give is to get some help. Now, people pleasing did not happen overnight and it's likely not going to untangle overnight either. A lot of times we need a good friend, pastor, mentor, uh, counselor to help us to unpack where some of this stuff began, why I'm doing it and what's triggering it. And of course, now how to stop. Because I can give you the, the, the bullet points on how to stop, but we really want to begin to take a journey back sometimes and recognize when did this start? Why did I, when and why did I feel the need to meet the needs of somebody else in order to feel good about myself? So a good counselor, pastor, friend can begin to do that for you. And I know it's not easy. You know, pastors are up to their ears in responsibilities. So they may not have the the consistency to be able to meet with you. Same with a friend, but also with a friend, she may not have the know-how either. So that's why I always recommend getting with a good Christian counselor. And I know they're hard to find. You know, we teamed up with Faithful Counseling In fact, Zoe, if you can do me a favor and post a link in the chat, guys, if you're watching on the replay, it will be in the description section below as well. Guys, check out this resource. Uh, Faithful Counseling is a network of counselors all across the United States. Uh, In fact, I'm not even sure if they're across the world. I really have to look into that. Um, And they will connect you with a counselor that is right for you. Now, remember, ask the right questions, do your due diligence, and don't just settle on somebody that they send your way. You know, a good Christian counselor is going to be hard to find. And on top of that, sometimes it's also a personality click too. So don't give up. I know many of you have worked with counselors in the past and they've let you down. They've disappointed you. I get it. They're human too. So don't give up. Keep searching. 
Uh, and I think if you use the link that we'll post, you'll get 10% off your first month's counseling. So if you do struggle with people pleasing, my friend, I want to encourage you, please reach out to somebody and get some help to begin to unpack this. So here's what I'd like to do before we dive into some questions. I want to pray with you. I want to pray that God will begin to release you of this bondage. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just come before you giving thanks that you are our all in all. Lord, you are our Savior, our Redeemer, our Comforter, our Guide, our Friend. Lord, I pray for that one watching right now that their aim would be to please you. I pray, Father, that in the mighty name of Jesus, you would break the bondage of fear right now off of that precious one. I pray, Father, that they would step boldly out of the fear of others and step confidently into your grace. Lord, your word says that if God is for us, who can be against us? So, Father, I pray for that one watching who's just so scared of what others think, being left alone. Lord, I pray that you would come by way of your Holy Spirit and minister hope. Wrap your loving arms around them and remind them, Daddy, that you are there. That you will never leave them, never forsake them. You will fight their battles and many times even speak the truth. They just only need to keep quiet. So, Father, I ask that you would quiet that anxiety that's going on inside. I pray, Father, that there would be a, a supernatural surrender. Your word says to cast our anxieties and that means to just catapult them. So, Father, I pray for that one watching, that they would stop laying down their anxiety and going and picking it back up again, but they would catapult them onto you, Lord Jesus, because you care for them. Father, break the bonds of insecurity. I pray that each and every one of your children would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that they would begin to embrace who they are and whose they are. And we declare this by faith as we step out to be God-pleasers. In Jesus' mighty name. My friend, if you agree with me, can you say amen? May you be a god pleaser. So I do want to go ahead and dive into some questions. Let's see what we have here. So JSB Recovered is asking, is people pleasing the same as codependency? Great question. Um, JSB, because I wanted to actually address that in just a few minutes, um, codependency is the need to be needed. It's basically saying, if you're okay, I'm okay. If you're not okay, I'm not okay. So I need you to be okay in order for me to feel okay. So I would venture to guess that every person who struggles with codependency struggles with people pleasing as well. Because remember, my identity is now rooted in somebody else. My preferences are now rooted in somebody else. So yes, there is a dependency going on. So people pleasing at its core, they struggle with codependency. In fact, we have a course that uh, I created. In fact, uh, Zoe, if you could go ahead and pop a link in the chat, and if you're watching on the replay, it will be in the description section below. This is such a problem 
in the body of Christ that I created an online course called Conquering Codependency Biblically. This, these are steps that are going to help you go from being a people pleaser to being a God pleaser. So definitely check that out. But to answer your question, yes, they definitely are connected. Because remember, I am now, my people pleasing is rooted in my dependency on somebody else's thoughts and feelings towards me. So please let me know if that answered your question. So Amanda is asking, the verse that speaks of loving and treating others as you do yourself, she's asking me to explain that. So thanks for bringing that up, Amanda. So we are called to love others as we love ourselves. But here's what happens with people pleasing. We tend to love others instead of ourselves. Loving others as we would love ourselves is treating them as though we would want to be treated. So let's go back to the analogy that I used before. My friends or my family, they want to go out, but I'm exhausted. And a a half an hour of just laying down would be the difference between me being completely refreshed and present and me (laughs) kind of coming out of my face and, and biting somebody's head off because I've just, I'm completely depleted. So God is not asking you to sacrifice yourself to that extent for the sake of somebody else. So I have to be able to meet my core needs first. Now, um, again, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that sometimes we don't. So for example, if I'm hungry and then somebody else is hungry as well, I may sacrifice my hunger and then give this to the other person. A lot of times we're going to do that but I also still have to care for myself. So in my world, I would have people pulling at me 24 hours a day. They would be asking me questions all over Instagram. I would be getting flooded with emails. I would be on live streams all day, every day, just to simply meet the needs of everybody. I can't. So does that mean that I'm not loving? Absolutely not. So... I want, I want you to begin to love others as you love yourself, which implies that you do love yourself, not love others instead of yourself. I have to have a healthy respect and love for myself and for my limitations as well. Amanda, please let me know if that answered your question. (laughs) Dave and Jane are asking, how is the dog doing from the 12 toxic days of Christmas? (laughs) So if you guys missed it, uh, we did this parody on the 12 toxic days of Christmas. We had such a blast doing that. Uh, If you've missed it, definitely check it out on the YouTube channel. And uh, Kevin made his cameo and he is actually, uh, I really hate to say it. He's not feeling well today. I've had to crate him all day. He's been um, having some expulsions that you probably don't want to hear about. So he's not doing well. And I ask that you would pray for Kevin. So he probably ate something that he shouldn't have. But thank you so much for asking. So Chloe is asking, how can I develop an authentic identity that is centered in Christ as I work on my self-esteem and heal from trauma? So Chloe, I would eliminate one of those. A lot of times we focus so much on our own self-esteem. Don't worry about your self-esteem because I assure you that if you get grounded in your identity in Christ, that self-esteem will fall into place. And at the end of the day, it's really not about my self-esteem because there's a lot of people in this world that feel pretty darn good about themselves and they are so far from God that they're not fulfilling his purpose. So Let's not focus on the self-esteem, but I would focus on getting grounded in your identity in Christ and healing from the trauma. So if you're not with a good Christian counselor, definitely get with one to work on healing that trauma. Also, Chloe, I want you to be um, very cognizant of the fact that this trauma is not your identity. I've seen this way too many times, and guys, please forgive me if if this is going to hurt your feelings, but... I know the trauma was traumatic. I know it was painful, but guys, it is not your identity. Stop identifying with your trauma. It happened to you, 
But if you know the Lord, he is going to use that for your good and for his glory. So stop identifying yourself as your trauma. It is not your lot in life. It is not your identity. So now we go back to how do I develop an authentic identity? Well, number one, we've got to dive into the word. I have to understand what does he say about me? Who does he say that I am? And the second thing you're going to have to do, Chloe, is you're going to have to believe it. Because a lot of times that that trauma speaks so loudly that we believe that over the word of God. So once you begin to truly embrace what God says about you and his promises for you, that's when that self-esteem is going to increase. That's when you're going to become grounded in who you are in Jesus. And it doesn't matter what's happened to you, what's happening to you, or what will happen to you. You are secure in Christ. Chloe, please let me know if that helped. So Sweet Tooth Mary, Marie, sorry, is asking, how can one overcome this in the workplace towards bosses where you may be asked to do something and you are unable to say no? Well, okay, so we got a couple of sides to this. So when you say unable to say no, here's where I want you to be very, very careful. We are always able to say no. It's just whether or not you're willing to suffer the consequences. So a lot of times people pleasers will say, I'm, I'm not able, as if it's a handicap. You're not handicapped and it's, you're not a victim. You are able to say no. So with that said, you have to recognize that you're not willing to say no because you're not willing to suffer the consequences that may come as a result of it. So no, I'm not playing semantics here. I'm actually putting you back into the driver's seat because you're not a victim. Now, if, so let's put that aside for a second. Now we we go back. If it is part of your job description, then yeah, you really shouldn't say no, or you're going to risk losing your job. And if you want to say no and risk losing your job, that's completely up to you. But if you don't want to lose your job, then you shouldn't say no. Not that you can't say no, you shouldn't say no. So now we start, it's a um, um, sweet tooth, Marie, I'm only going by kind of what I have in here. So then in, in my counseling mind, I start to formulate different circumstances that could be taking place. So I don't, I'm not imposing anything on you. I'm not saying that this is what's taking place, but I'm hopefully able to answer your question along with being able to help somebody else that may be in the same a similar situation, but just a little bit different. So let's say you're in a situation where it's not part of your job description. You're being asked to do things that are way above what your pay grade is, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, You're being asked to work extra hours or do somebody else's job. You're asking, what do we do in that case? Well, we still have to find a way to say no. We still have to find that way to say, and, and you know, I, I could go through like how to say it. In fact, one of the things that the Holy Spirit has put on me is this, um, this idea to create like a how to say it series. So in your case, like how do I say no to a boss who's asking me to do a coworker's job? How do I say no? Because it's not just a matter of no, it's how do I say it in a way that is respectful, but at the same time is also firm and makes my desires known. So unfortunately, that's not something we're going to have time to dive into today, but it is a matter of determining how do I say no. It's not just a matter of do I say yes or do I say no or not, it's how do I say no. And there is always a way to say no. So we've got a couple of different scenarios that were taking place there. So hopefully that has helped. Um, yeah, I, I, guys, I know we're running low on time here and I have a feeling that this series may need a part two. 
So would you do me a favor in the chat and let me know if, if you would appreciate a part two to this, because I see so many questions that are flooding in and we're actually out of time today, but I want to be able to address as many as possible. So um, please know that I do grab as many questions as possible. And a lot of times I go in after the fact and some of your questions actually spark future videos. So don't hesitate. Although I can't answer any more questions right now, they do definitely give me ideas for how to be able to help you moving forward. So I do want to invite you to check out the Conquering Codependency course. Guys, if you're struggling with people pleasing, it's highly likely you're struggling with codependency. And I'm going to teach you how to overcome this biblically. If you're interested in learning the 10 scriptures that prove that you are not a doormat, I want you to go ahead and check out this episode right here. I'll also include it in the description section below. Okay, my friend, that's all the time that we have for today. It has been my joy connecting with you. Until next time, remember, all things are possible with God. Bye for now.